Hello, and you are listening to Eco Justice Radio on KPFK Los Angeles and KPFT Houston. A project of SoCal 350 Climate Action, our show presents environmental and climate stories from a social justice frame featuring voices not necessarily heard on mainstream media. Eco Justice Radio acknowledges that we record the show on the traditional territory of the Tongva. Welcome. I am Jessica Aldridge. On today's show, No More Joshua Trees, Climate Change in the Desert, I will be interviewing James Cornett, desert ecologist and principal biologist at JWC Ecological Consultants. James Cornett is the former director of natural sciences at the Palm Springs Desert Museum. He holds a BA and MS degree in biology and is the author of over three dozen books on aspects of desert environments, including his most recent on the Joshua Tree. Dozens of his scientific papers have focused on iconic desert plants, including the desert fan palm, Ocotillo, and Joshua Tree. Several of his studies have examined impacts of climate change on plant populations. Jim is the principal biologist at JWC Ecological Consultants, where he conducts studies on threatened and endangered species as a part of California's environmental review process. The Joshua Tree, icon of California deserts, has evolved to thrive in the dry, hot southwestern ecosystem. Climate change, however, with hotter, drier summers and more frequent brush fires, threatens that someday soon, Joshua Tree National Park will no longer have any Joshua Trees. Our guest today calls this special tree a keystone species with an uncertain future. In fact, many other important desert plants and animals are endangered as well. On our show, we talk about the unique symbiosis between the Ocotillo blossoms and migrating hummingbirds and the odd couple relationship between the spiny teddy bear choya and the innovative wood rat. So where are the solutions to protecting the desert and a changing climate? Are solar farms in the desert an appropriate renewable energy solution, or do they cause more harm than good? And what about the consequences of lithium mining in Death Valley for electrical vehicle batteries? Today, our guest, James Cornett, will share with us his many decades of studying and writing about desert ecosystems, what landscape changes we can expect in the future, and what solutions are needed with a heating climate. Thank you for tuning in to No More Joshua Trees, Climate Change in the Desert. I am your host, Jessica Aldridge, and it is my honor to welcome our guest, James Cornett, desert ecologist and principal biologist at JWC Ecological Consultants. Welcome to Eco Justice Radio. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for being here. We have a an interesting and exciting conversation ahead of us. We're going to dive into this conversation about the desert, its beautiful and important ecosystem, the lovely yet disappearing Joshua tree, and the impacts of climate destruction. And before we get into the details, Jim, paint us a picture of a desert ecology and its vast biodiversity, a, a landscape that many humans consider uninhabitable. Well, well, you know, deserts environments are unique on the planet because the diversity and abundance of plant and animal life is completely dependent upon the amount of rainfall that comes in a given year. In fact, it's the lack of water that limits the abundance and diversity of plant and animal life. So it's, un, it's unique in that respect and unlike any other environment on the planet. In those rare instances when it does get rain, then we see this explosion of life, best depicted by the wildflower displays that you see in the springtime and years when we have above average winter rainfall, which unfortunately isn't quite as common as it used to be. And you have written multiple books about desert environments. Geographically, where do you focus your attention and and why do you focus your attention there? Well, of course, initially, my focus is on the California desert region because it's the area that I have easy 
accessibility to. However, my study sites run all the way from West Texas, Big Bend National Park and Carlsbad Caverns, all the way back to California and Anza Borrego Desert State Park, Josh Tree National Park and Death Valley National Park. Those are all areas where I have official study sites and we're doing ongoing work on the effect of a changing climate on desert plants. And Joshua trees. Joshua, I know this is a big topic right now. And there's this immense love, I think, I mean, for me, at least, for, for Joshua trees. And so Joshua trees and the National Park of the same name, they're iconic. They're iconic desert attractions. And we're going to discuss in a moment why they are disappearing. But let's first speak to its importance. A writer once described a Joshua tree as this misshapen pirate with belt boot hands and teeth stuck full of daggers. And I, I, I'm, I'm sure that your opinion on a Joshua tree might you know, differ a little bit. Why is this plant a keystone species to the desert ecology? Well, it's the only tree that you'll find on the desert flatlands of the Mojave Desert. There really is no other tree. You go up to into the higher desert mountains and you'll find pinyon pines and junipers and in the washes, maybe desert willows and smoke trees. But on the vast uh, and expansive flatlands, the Joshua tree is the only tree that occurs there. And because of that, it provides u- a unique shelter opportunity for nesting birds, including woodpeckers and red-tailed hawks, Scots orioles, the uh, fruits that are produced in the springtime are a very important food resource for desert animals, in some cases critically so. And what's really interesting, in times of intense drought, the Joshua tree is a veritable desert canteen. It provides a source of moisture for a variety of desert animals, from jackrabbits and antelope squirrels to kangaroo rats and wood rats. The jackrabbits, for example, are known to chew through the bark to get to the moist tissue, and they'll chew on that to get water during times of intense drought. So Joshua trees, because they provide emergency sources of water, food, and then shelter for so many animals, are really a keystone species in the Mojave Desert. And without Joshua trees, the biodiversity of the Mojave Desert would plummet dramatically. Wow. I just know that there's so much love for the Joshua tree. I mean, there's people who make songs about the Joshua tree. And I just think that it's a magnificent, beautiful plant. There's been these reports lately that have come out that the Joshua tree actually might be going extinct in certain areas. Is this actually true? Is the existence of the Joshua tree threatened? Yes, uh, most definitely. Uh, In 1987, I established 10 Joshua tree study sites from western Arizona to southwestern Utah, southern Nevada, and then a number of sites in California from Death Valley National Park to Josh Tree National Park. And of those 10 sites, there's only one whose population appears to be growing. There was another one at Sema Dome in the Mojave National Preserve whose population seemed stable, but then we had the dome fire uh, last summer. And it wiped out almost a a quarter of all the Joshua trees in Mojave National Preserve. And so, and my study site, by the way, was completely engulfed in flames, killing killing all the Joshua trees on the site with the exception of four trees that survived, somehow missed the flames. Uh, So that site, even though it was moderately stable, in other words, every Joshua tree that died was replaced by a juvenile tree that uh, grew up from seed. And... Lost, there were 132, uh, lost 128 of them. So instead of it being stable, it plummeted and it had the biggest decrease because of the fire of any of the 10 Joshua tree sites. Uh, The only one that's doing well is at Lee Flat and Death Valley National Park. And maybe later we can talk about why that happens to be the case. Yeah, of course. We're definitely going to get into Death Valley. Are these trees disappearing because of why is I I can assume that it's climate disruption but there's so many detailed layers to what that actually means like why are we having this problem Uh, it's pretty straightforward with the Joshua tree and it's simply because of the increasing frequency and intensity of the droughts that we're having right now we've seen a 50 percent increase in the successive drought years in the Mojave Desert So in other words, 
there are a lot more periods when there might be two, three, four, even five years of drought than there used to be. And a Josh tree can get through one year of drought, but it's going to have grave difficulty getting through five years of drought. And so those successive years of drought, plus an increase in temperature of a couple of degrees, has spelled the doom for most of the Joshua trees on most of my study sites. Oh my God. I was recently in San Diego. I was walking around a neighborhood close to Old Town San Diego, and I saw this garden nursery. And it had this big banner. It was advertising that people should grow Joshua trees from seeds, that they would provide them seeds, and that would help save the species. Is this a good idea, having people grow Joshua trees from seeds? Can we as individuals reforest this ailing species by growing our own Joshua tree? No. (laughs) The reason I say that is there's two reasons, basically. Number one, if you grow a Joshua tree from seed, uh, you buy a packet of Joshua tree seeds, which you can do, and you buy a packet and you plant one of those, you don't know where that seed came from. And my advice is always that if you're going to plant a Joshua tree seed, it had to originate naturally within about one mile of where you want to plant it. So if you went out and collected your own seeds in Victorville, for example, and you wanted to plant those around your house, that'd probably be fine as long as you were reasonably close to where that seed was originally born. And the reason for that is that that seed has a genetic package which makes it perfectly adapted for the area where it was originally found. And if you go and plant a seed from Arizona in Victorville, that seed may spread and maladaptive gene or set of genes into the local Josh tree population. And they'll no longer be perfectly adapted for the environment uh, of the Victorville area. It's just one example. So uh, it actually can have harmful effects. Now, if you want to go collect seeds in the Victorville area and you want to plant those seeds in the Victorville area, more power to you. The other problem, not so much with seeds, but certainly with young plants, is that if you transplant a young plant from, let's say, somewhere in Arizona into the California deserts, you may be bringing along with that uh, seed, but more likely a small plant, uh, some diseases for which the local Joshua trees don't have any resistance. So you should never be releasing a living thing except very, very close to where it was captured or found. Very important. So I applaud the people who want to do something but, you know, plant getting a seed from a location you have no idea where its origin was can be counterproductive. It's a really good lesson for many of us out there. I had no idea. I saw the sign and I was like, wow, that seems so great. You know, I knew that you and I were going to speak soon. So, you know, serendipitous on that. How long does it take a Joshua tree to grow from a seed? I'm just wondering. Well, the seed can germinate fairly rapidly and germinates quite easily. You can germinate them in, you know, in your kitchen, if you wish. So once they get wet, and if the temperature is relatively warm, they grow fairly fast. We've recorded growth rates of anywhere from six to eight inches, sometimes each year for a young Joshua tree. A typical Joshua tree in the California deserts, in let's say in Joshua Tree National Park, those Joshua trees would probably branch at around 25 years of age, maybe a little older. So they, they have slow but steady growth. There are many other trees that grow much more rapidly than Joshua trees, but their growth can be measured on a yearly basis. And that's one of the things we do on our study sites. And that being said, do you think it's too late for the Joshua tree? In terms of surviving as a species? Yeah. No, I don't. I think that what I told the state of California, the uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife, is I told them that Uh, If you want to preserve Joshua trees, you're going to have to preserve them in areas over 4,000 feet in elevation and north of an imaginary line, latitudinal line that would go through the town of Mojave. So what I'm predicting in the next century is pretty much the complete loss of Joshua trees in the southern part of their range, including Joshua Tree National Park. But they should do quite well at Lee Flat, for example, in Death Valley National Park and many other areas that are uh, at some of those higher latitudes. 
So all you listeners out there, if you, if you love the Joshua tree and you just, how about you just love nature in general, we're going to, we're going to talk at the end of the show in regards to some of the solutions that we as individuals can take part in, in order to preserve our desert and preserve our ecological system by diversity of our desert. So please stay tuned. We're going to dive into many more conversations around desert ecology. So the, the desert is already really hot. Death Valley, which is in the northern Mojave Desert in California, that's called the hottest place on earth. How do we gauge the effect of climate disruption in a place that is already, well, hot as hell? (laughs) Well, you know, that's a a good question. And a lot of people were believing that somehow the desert environments of California, indeed the entire Southwest, would be able to handle climate change because they're used to warm, hot temperatures, and the deserts are also accustomed to receiving very little rainfall in a typical year. And because of that, just two years ago, I initiated a repeat photography project because we wanted to actually see what the difference was between, say, a century ago and today. So we would return to these uh, precise spots in the desert and then take another picture. And what we look for is vegetation change. That's how we tell how the changing climate is affecting the desert environment, actually all environments, but using desert vegetation like the Joshua tree, we can actually get a handle on the impact of the warmer temperatures and decrease in rainfall. And so I'm kind of in the middle of that project now. And we look at plant life. That's the best way to gather the data we need. And there's been a lot of interesting studies lately by other scientists, one of which use satellite imagery to demonstrate that in certain areas of the California desert, vegetation has declined by 40%. So you're you're dealing with a fairly sparsely vegetated area already, and then it goes down by 40% in the last half century. And what are you seeing? I mean, because you're you're measuring this. So what are you seeing that indicates that climate disruption or climate changing is taking place in the desert? Well, of course, as I mentioned just a minute ago, we certainly see a decline in the number of Joshua trees on most of our study sites and in most of the Mojave Desert. Uh, we're also studying Ocotillos, and we're finding a very similar trend with Ocotillos as well, a plant of the the lower desert of California, and then on east to Big Bend National Park. We're losing about 1% to 2% of our Ocotillos a year off of those sites with no recruitment in California and in southern Arizona. What really surprised me was our studies with desert fan palms. In fact, I just completed a paper It was published in the Journal of the International Palm Society, where one of the more popular, more scenic oases in Anza Borrego Desert State Park is now uh, faced with a situation at 17 Palms where there's no recruitment. So that oasis is going to vanish as soon as all the adult palms die. And we think that that is largely a result of climate change, an increase in temperature and a decrease in rainfall. In that particular case, There may be some issue with groundwater reaching the surface. And one of the aspects of that is that we believe that the palm oases were recharged continuously with fossil groundwater, groundwater that developed a million years ago and has been there ever since and just naturally and routinely comes to the surface. Finding out that climate change is affecting even those aquifers and the springs that uh, emanate from them. So it's a pervasive, but what we're seeing is just a decrease in the number of plants and a complete absence of reproduction. Scary. It is scary. It's very scary. And I, I think because we, a lot of people don't live out in the desert, that this isn't like something that's obviously around us, but this is something that is is happening. And these are areas that people enjoy. And what they enjoy about the desert, the Joshua trees, the oasis, they're not going to be there. And and I wanted to talk about the oasis later. So I do have a question in regards to that. But to jump ahead just a little bit, for these oasis, you, you stumble upon these really beautiful, surprising aspects of this desert ecosystem. And, and that's this a desert oasis with the palm palms that you mentioned. It's like this mysterious water spring. 
where does that water come from? Just to, I know that you talked about fossil water sources, but if you could just explain that a little bit more. Sure. If we go back just 10,000 years ago, we enter the last ice age, uh, what we call the Pleistocene Ice Age. And during that time, it rained a lot more. Desert environments got anywhere from two to four times more rainfall. And although some of that rainfall evaporates and some runs off, Most of it sinks into the soil. And if there's enough rainfall, that water percolates through the soil, sometimes to a depth of many hundreds of feet. And what it eventually the water hits bedrock. It can't proceed downward any further. And then it starts to rise towards the surface. Now, most aquifers don't reach the surface, but occasionally there are faults in the earth. Some people somewhat erroneously call them earthquake faults, but they're cracks in the earth. And that allows the uh, fossil water to rise to the surface. Because remember that fossil water is several hundred feet down. It's overlain by a lot of heavy soil, which puts pressure on that water. So if you have a crack, a valve, if you will, then that water can come right up to the surface. And in the California deserts anyway, uh, if the water reaches the surface sooner or later, there are going to be fan palms that arrive there by seeds, usually by birds, sometimes by coyotes. The mysterious oasis in the middle of the desert. We're going to take a break here quickly and come right back to it. We're going to talk about wildfires in the desert. Hey, listeners, quick break here. We hope that you're enjoying Eco Justice Radio. We air every Monday at 9 a.m. on KPFT Houston and every Wednesday at 3 p.m. on KPFK Los Angeles. Stay connected to us by subscribing to Eco Justice Radio on all major podcast apps and visit our website, ecojusticeradio.org. There you can check out previous shows and guests and get connected with us on social media. Today you are listening to No More Joshua Trees, Climate Change in the Desert with host Jessica Aldridge, myself, and guest James Cornett, desert ecologist and principal biologist at JWC Ecological Consultants. Jim, wildfires in the desert. People might not expect wildfires as a threat in like a desert environment because you don't, maybe people don't think of a desert catching fire, but this is an issue. How is this the case? How do we have wildfires in the desert? And are wildfires becoming more prevalent in the Southwest deserts? And, and, and why is that? It is a surprise that there might be wildfires in the desert. And in fact, there are. And as far as we can tell, wildfires in the desert were quite rare before 1950. And there's two reasons why they are more common today. First of all, it's hotter and drier. So the fuel that's there is more likely to burn and more likely to burn rapidly. So any area that is subjected to lightning strikes, particularly in the summer, are much more likely to catch on fire because the fuel is drier than it used to be. In addition to that, though, there's been a lot of exotic plant species that have been accidentally, most of the time, introduced into the desert environment, particularly grasses. And now we have fuel corridors between each creosote shrub, between each Joshua tree, between each Ocotillo. And the fire can, let's say a lightning strike hits an Ocotillo plant, it begins to burn. And now there's a fuel corridor from that Ocotillo plant to the next Ocotillo plant, a fuel corridor made up of exotic weed species and introduced grasses uh, that did not used to be there. And this, uh, those two reasons then are why we're seeing more wildfires in desert. Unfortunately, there's not a very good historical record of the frequency of fires. So it's difficult for us to have long-term comparisons. Um, in 1890, nobody was writing about Joshua Tree fires. And so the records weren't really kept effectively and accurately until after 1965. So we we don't have a century's worth of fire data. We have, at best, a half century in some places. I I should point out, though, that on my 10 Joshua Tree study uh, study sites, none of them showed any sign of a past burn. You know, I couldn't find any charred wood or anything like that on any of the 10 study sites when I began in 1987. Now it's 2021, and three of those 10 Joshua Tree study sites have burned up. Uh, So at least in my experience, I'd have to say that fire seems to be more frequent, rather dramatically so. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Going back to, you know, the diverse and and important ecology of the desert and talking about like the plants and the animals, I want to pick your brain. You, You 
so many books detailing the specifics of different species in in the desert ecology. And you keep mentioning this plant that's called the Ocotillo. And this, this plant is the Southwest's most widespread plant. It's known for its beautiful red spring flowers. So maybe if the audience doesn't know what an Ocotillo is, maybe you know those plants with these beautiful red flowers in them and go look it up. Can you just dive a little bit into the Ocotillo and tell me how they're faring? You know, are they protected? What's happening there? Ocotillos are a pretty amazing plant for a lot of reasons. First of all, they have a fairly distinctive appearance. They consider a teepee, turn it upside down, take the animal skins off, and you're left with a wooden frame with a bunch of uh, sticks emanating from a single point and then going straight up into the air at uh, slight angles. So they have an iconic appearance. Uh, If you go travel through the Southwest, there are a lot of businesses that use Ocotillos in their logo. In fact, over 100 uh, in the American Southwest. So they have an iconic appearance. But most importantly, they produce their multitudes of blossoms, usually thousands of blossoms on a large Ocotillo, uh, every year, whether it rains or not. And it's the only plant that does that in the, uh, the desert regions of the Southwest. Consequently, if you're an animal that likes nectar and needs the water produced by the Ocotillo, you're going to have that uh, nectar and water available to you even in a drought year. In a year when we get average rainfall or even above average rainfall, there'll be even more. But that uh, source of food and water that's guaranteed has become invaluable to a number of animals. Well, that just brings up the hummingbird. <laughs> I was <laughs> right? hoping you would ask about that. <laughs> I mean, they rely heavily on the Ocotillo plant for its food. And so if the Ocotillo is suffering, what does that say about the future of the hummingbirds? And I know people have a love for Joshua trees and they have a love for hummingbirds as well. Yes. I did a little study. I asked people, would you rather hear a lecture about hummingbirds or Joshua trees? Most people picked hummingbirds. <laughs> but uh, So hummingbirds are unique to the uh, New World. They're not found in Europe or Asia, any place. And, and they are unique in the bird world because they can fly backwards. They have an incredibly high metabolic rate. And most of them migrate. They just can't handle cold winters in much of the western United States because they're so small and they would easily freeze. So they migrate down to Mexico and spend the winter there. In some places, they spend the winter in the Sonoran Desert, uh, the southern deserts of the United States, but they need to go to places where it doesn't typically freeze on winter uh, winter nights. Well, they come back in the springtime, and they uh, require a lot of nectar, a surprising amount of sugar water. Now, they can get that at your feeder, if you put a feeder in your backyard, and I hope you do. But more importantly, and uh, over the long term, before we arrived on the scene, they were getting their nectar from Ocotillos. And what's really interesting is that if you look at a map of the distribution of the Ocotillo, it goes from West Texas all the way to uh, Southern California. And that is the most important pathway for hummingbird migration of any other place in North or South America. That little corridor has 10 species of hummingbirds that come up through it every year. And the Ocotillo is a guaranteed source of energy for those migrating hummingbirds, whether it's a dry year or a wet year. It doesn't matter that Ocotillos reliably produce that. And because hummingbirds rely on it so much, and in dry years, it's the only source of nectar, um, they can be assured that they'll be able to complete their migratory journey. And that's why it's of concern if we're losing 1% of the Ocotillos every year, in 100 years, a lot of areas, particularly in California, may very well be without uh, Ocotillos. And I hate to think what's going to happen to those migratory hummingbirds. Uh, To be honest, they're going to be in real trouble if it's a drought year and there are no Ocotillos to get them through that journey. 
Can we as everyday people support that hummingbird population? I know that you just said putting out hummingbird feeders. So if we put out feeders, how many feeders do we need in order to support the disappearing 1% per year of ocadillos? Well, there aren't always a lot of things that humans can do to make a difference in the survival of wild animals, in this case, hummingbirds. But in the case of hummingbirds, humans can make the difference between disaster and uh, an extravaganza if there are enough hummingbird feeders. So for every ocotillo that dies, if about five to ten hummingbird feeders are put out in that in a comparable area, that can make up for the loss of that ocotillo. Where I am right now, I, I visited a friend of mine, and he's got 10 hummingbird feeders in his yard. And uh, it's, it's like a, a traffic jam there because there's so many hummingbirds. But he's, he, what he's doing is compensating for the loss of flowering plants that produce nectar throughout the West. Not, it's not just the Ocotillo, of course. And probably saving a lot of hummingbirds in the process. And he gets tremendous joy out of it. He likes to hold the feeder in his hand so the hummingbird will oh, come wow. perch on his fingers and drink uh, from the feeder that's in, <laughs> resting in his palm. It's kind of cute. It's cute, but they are feisty little animals. <laughs> it's because they're desperate for that nectar. They yeah. really need that because of their unusually high metabolic rates. Yes, yes. Another sort of feisty species is a plant species. That is sweetly called the teddy bear choya. And it's in, and so the chair, teddy bear choya plant and the wood rat have this interdependent, you know, they're two interdependent species. And the teddy bear choya, it's, it's like I said, it's, it's sort of this kind name for this densely covered plant with these sharp spines that will sp- stick to anything in its way. So if you've gone into Joshua Tree, you probably have experienced the choya plant. However, the wood rats, they seem to have this like uncanny ability to utilize the choya to make it to upgrade their homes in essence. What is the relationship between the choya, the teddy bear choya and the wood rat? And how is climate disruption uh, changing that symbiosis? Well, the, the wood rat is an interesting rodent. I, I always am a little disturbed by the fact that it, it's called a rat because rat has such a bad connotation of people. The wood rat is actually quite cute compared with city rats that might be in downtown Los Angeles or someplace. And they have, they have three kinds of reliances upon the jumping choy. Number one, they get the moisture. They require moist food every single day. And they can get their moisture from those choya segments, those choya balls that are like a fortress that they can put their little noses into the middle of that cactus to start chewing it and getting at the moist tissue beneath the spines is quite amazing. And that's what they do. And uh, in addition to that, they will uh, grab the choya segment by a spine, pull it over to their above ground nest. And their nests end up resembling a three-foot-high pile of choya segments, which uh, seems like an almost an impossibility for that rodent to carry the, so many of those choya balls in its mouth. But it does, and those choya balls protect the wood rat and its young inside the nest from predators, and it works very, very well. So whenever you see jumping choyas, you're going to see wood rat nests in the area uh, amongst the choyas. Now, some people think that the wood rat never gets stuck with the spines. And there have been some, we'll say, autopsies done on wood rats that have died of natural causes. And it's typical that you'll find a few handful of spines buried in their skin and then walled off with scar tissue. So they do get stuck. It's not a perfect world. But uh, considering the alternatives, that moisture availability, and then the use of the balls on their nests, and I forgot to mention they will eat the fruits. They get some protein from the seeds inside of the fruits as well. So they provide food, moisture, and shelter for wood rats. And what we have found is that if you don't have at least some species of choya in an area, you're not going to have any wood rats. And on a given acre of desert landscape, 
the wood rat is likely the largest occupant of that acre in terms of weight. They weigh about 145 grams, so about a third of a pound. And uh, since there won't be a jackrabbit on every acre of desert landscape, the wood rat usually is the largest occupant. Well, people don't, you know, like you said, people don't want rats around. Do we want wood rats? <laughs> it I, mean, I assume the answer I, is I, yes. I live on the, but... <laughs> I live on the edge of the desert and I have wood rats and we live with them. Once we went away for a month on a, a vacation, a trip, and came back to discover a wood rat had built its nest in our barbecue on the back patio. The problem was, is that I didn't know the wood rat was there and I turned the barbecue off. <laughs> the flames shoot up. The wood oh, rat no. jumps about six feet high. He had a little bit of his fur was singed. And as he left the uh, back wall of the backyard, he gave me a look that I would swear he was telling me to go someplace <laughs> where the sun doesn't shine. So, uh, there, Maybe uh, the solution here, the answer is that do we want wood rats? Maybe it's, do we want humans in the desert? Maybe that's, maybe that's the uh, answer. <laughs> that, that would be the, uh, the natural way to look at it. Sure. And, uh, so we, we tolerate wood rats building their nests in our yard. We have a couple right now, but not in the barbecue. <laughs> They're not allowed in the barbecue. <laughs> I don't think they want to be in the barbecue. Um, <laughs> So we just talked about the wood rat. There's also another species out there that I, again, I think a lot of people love turtles. I had this experience. I was in Joshua Tree and I was hiking to the 49 Palms Oasis and I was on the trail. I think I was taking a photo or something. I just stopped on the trail and I just heard this grunt and this really large hiss that sent me flying. I know I probably jumped back or something and I looked down and I encountered this extraordinary large and vocal tortoise can you you tell us about the the desert tortoise and how they survive in this ecosystem and then also i know you and i spoke previously to the show and you were like a tortoise that size in the desert is not normal so so can you talk about that as well sure tortoises the desert tortoise and actually you could say all tortoises in general but the desert tortoise reaches its greatest size in captivity because it gets food every day. Good owners, you know, feed it of a wide variety of plant materials. And so they get quite large. Unfortunately, a lot of people get tired of their pet tortoise that they have acquired, hopefully legally through a tortoise adoption program, but they get tired of it. And they say, well, I'm going to release it back into the wild where its ancestors came from. And so they take out this big old tortoise out and release it. And and that may very well, on that particular trail, that's where people have been known to release tortoises. It's illegal. You're not supposed to do it. The reason you shouldn't do it is that tortoises in your yard oftentimes uh, are harboring diseases, which are just run rampant through desert, wild desert tortoise populations. So if you don't want your tortoise anymore, take it to a place. There are a lot of adoption places that will accept tortoises and then give them to owners that promise to take care of them. And, uh, but they um, now generally a tortoise in captivity wouldn't hiss at you. So you may have just have found a, <laughs> uh, a large angry tortoise that you're scared. <laughs> you got scared, but it was, it was scared enough to hiss. It was a mutual scaring. <laughs> <laughs> well, remember you're, you're much larger than the biggest desert tortoise. So the size difference is scary to most yes. animals, not just tortoises. Okay. How, how does a tortoise, though, survive? Like, I, I don't know if people understand what they're surviving on. I know they have these little burrows and there's the plants, you know, because we're talking about climate disruption and the fact that we need water in order for the plants to grow. So how are they surviving? They're struggling, to be sure, because they rely heavily on winter rainfall to germinate wildflower seeds. They come out of their burrow when it starts to warm up, usually in March, and they go out and for about three months, they feed nonstop, eating all the wildflowers they can get in their stomachs. And then sometime in June, early June, sometimes even late May, they go into estivation in the burrow and they don't come out again and they stay there. So 
If you're a reptile, you can lower your metabolic rate, go into a burrow, not burn up any calories, and then reappear when the rain once again brings out the wildflowers. So three months of feeding, about nine months in your burrow. Thank you. So we're going to take a really quick break, and then we're going to come back and talk about solar panels in the desert, lithium batteries, and and solutions beyond that, solutions that we can, can take to protect the desert. We'll be right back. Hey, listeners, quick break here. We hope that you're enjoying Eco Justice Radio. We air every Monday at 9 a.m. on KPFT Houston and every Wednesday at 3 p.m. on KPFK Los Angeles. Stay connected to us by subscribing to Eco Justice Radio on all major podcast apps and visit our website, ecojusticeradio.org. There you can check out previous shows and guests and get connected with us on social media. Today you are listening to No More Joshua Trees, Climate Change in the Desert with host Jessica Aldridge, myself, and guest James Cornett, desert ecologist and principal biologist at JWC Ecological Consultants. So we have been talking about the desert tortoise And one of the issues that comes up with the desert tortoise is this idea of building solar farms in the desert. And people who are in opposition of the solar farms in the desert are, you know, one of the many reasons is that they believe by putting solar farms in desert ecology, that that is detrimental to tortoise populations. What is your opinion, Jim, on that? If if you put in a solar field... And some of them cover many square miles of desert flatland habitat, which is also in in California and in Nevada, for that matter, is also desert tortoise habitat. You're extracting several square miles of desert tortoise habitat from the population. And um, on all the solar fields that I have examined, and I've been hired to examine a lot of them over the years, they completely grade away all the desert vegetation, all the desert animals beneath the solar panels. Consequently, typically what they do is they go in and they collect the tortoises. But what do you do with the tortoises? You know, if, if it's suitable desert tortoise habitat, it's more likely than not already occupied by desert tortoises. So you can't release 100 tortoises into an already saturated habitat. The, the best solution would be to spot grade only where the solar panels are going to go. So you leave some vegetation underneath them and then allow the tortoises to return to that site after it's been completed. And that has been done in some areas. I don't have any firsthand information about the success of that, but I certainly support the effort and then the studies that will take place afterwards. So we know if it, if it works, it should work though, because the solar panels in theory could provide some shade for the tortoises, which in the desert, they don't mind. I can assure you that I would think that the site biologist would know when a desert tortoise burrow is safe to be for a tortoise to dig one there. And maybe when they need the tortoise to dig a burrow someplace else, Uh, tortoises love to build Uh, their burrows underneath concrete platforms because the concrete provides a more stable ceiling to their burrow. And then plants will grow up between and under the solar panels that the tortoises can eat. So there's a possibility there of them working together. Uh, That being said, it is not possible for all the other animals, though, like kit foxes, for example, to continue to exist in those areas. And that's why I advocate to Uh, No more solar fields until every home in California has a rooftop solar panel insulation on it. Uh, Do that first. Yes, please. Rooftop solar. It's so many, many rooftops that first and foremost. Yeah. Solar on the rooftops. There's this project. I know that you had talked, you just had mentioned moving tortoises. The Bureau of Land Management has this plan. It's in the Gemini Solar Project in Nevada. And the concept is to move tortoises off the site for up to two years during the construction and then return the tortoises after the solar panels have been assault. Is uprooting animals and their ha- from their habitat questionable? And I think you sort of already alluded to this. Is it questionable and can it actually be done in a safe way? Um, I think it has potential to be successful. 
But I'm very concerned about it because, first of all, when you take the tortoises out, you're going to lose two years of reproduction. That can be devastating to a tortoise population if they're unable to successfully reproduce over that uh, time period. Taking them off the site is one thing, but trying to, you really need to put each tortoise or each, uh, the female tortoises off by themselves. You cannot put a male tortoise in with a female tortoise year round because the males are aggressive constantly around the females and it is very difficult for female tortoises. So you lost a two years reproduction. You're probably not going to be able to reproduce them wherever you hold them for those two years. That could be devastating. So the question is, could the tortoises compensate for that by more successful reproduction after you return return them to the solar farm? It depends on uh, who's operating the solar farm, what safeguards are in place. Is there a full-time biological monitor on that site, which in my opinion there there should be, to make sure the tortoises are... uh, monitored, watched, and sometimes assisted if necessary in in placing of burrows and whatnot. So I I think it's worth trying. And then uh, properly done, we might discover that it works. Great. But if it doesn't work, we need to admit that and then consider the fact that we need to look at these solar fields a little bit differently if we can never release tortoises back on the site. I, I don't discount the need for solar fields as we go more and more electric. You know, we're just now scratching the surface with the use of electric cars. And you can imagine the electrical needs that will skyrocket if electric cars start becoming really prevalent and common. So we need to look at these solar fields in light of our energy needs in the future. We would hope that we wouldn't have to lower our standard of living because we, we're we generating lots of uh, renewable energy, renewable electrical energy. But uh, I, th- I think it's always worth looking at a compromise solutions where you can save a, a threatened species and still have solar energy. After that, you put them on all the roofs. After the roofs. <laughs> um, and that brings up another really good question that, you know, lithium. Lithium is used in a variety of renewable energy technologies, such as batteries that power the electric vehicles that you just mentioned. Recently, there was this Australian-based corporation that proposed building a lithium mine located on a prehistoric lake bed in the Panama Valley that's next to the, the Death Valley National Park in California. Yes. Tell us about this, you know, the dangers proposed by the that the mining by mining lithium. And then, you know, tell us a little bit about Death Valley. I know we were going to get into the importance of Death Valley. Yeah, the um, lithium is associated with evaporite minerals, dry lake beds, etc. Places where salt water has accumulated for long periods of time. The first thing we have to remember is that we've been going through a number of elements to see which makes the best batteries. Today, it's lithium. Ten years from now, it may be something else. We don't really know. But let's assume for a second that lithium ends up being the best uh, element that might be in uh, batteries of the future and of today. The demand will be huge. Right now, most lithium comes out of China. It gives China uh, a distinct advantage over other nations. Uh, So there'll be a lot of pressure to uh, uh, go after lithium in the United States and in other places in the world to develop resources that might not be so readily available as they are in China. My my take on that is that uh, most of your desert dry lake beds are uh, lifeless environments uh, for the most part. There's some exceptions with pupfish and some uh, smaller invertebrate animals, but um, these are uh, dead lifeless environments. And so there's a potential of utilizing these uh, without disrupting the desert ecology. But whenever we're starting to explain a new resource, we have to, uh, this is where we want to move in baby steps ahead, make sure that we dot the I's and cross the T's and that we know the long-term ramifications of disturbing uh, dry lake beds and desert environments. And hopefully we can do it without environmental impacts. But, you know, we're just getting started on this. 
And so a lot more research, a lot more study has to do before I would be willing to authorize broad scale uh, lithium extraction throughout every conceivable environment. Uh, one of the proposals is to extract it from the sea bottom and massive projects that uh, God knows what kind of ecological ramifications that might have. So I'm always, I'm always cautious, uh, very cautious as we begin to exploit these uh, resources. Yeah. Another resource too is water. A few years ago, the Cadiz, I think it's called Cadiz uh, and and some water agencies were pushing a well-funded plan to pump out the aquifers, the water aquifers in the Mojave Desert and pipeline that as drinking water for our ever-expanding communities in Southern California. Is this particular project firmly dead and is this idea of pumping water out of desert areas an ongoing risk? The idea is not dead to the best of my knowledge. And of course, the aquifer in the Cades Basin is finite. Eventually, they'll pump out all the water. It'll be gone. And then we're stuck with this hundreds of uh, pipeline, many hundreds of miles in length. And based on past, pra- uh, past practices, that pipeline will be there for eternity because they're not going to take what money they have and then remove it. We just don't see that. I mean, there are so many old pipelines in the Mojave Desert, in the Colorado Desert of Southeastern California. It's uh, uh, quite shocking, to be realistic. The Cades Basin obviously results in a number of important water holes and springs for desert animals. And the research that I have seen thus far does not guarantee the survival of those springs and water holes with the pumping out the elimination really eventually of that groundwater in the Cades Basin. So those issues have to be resolved first, and they have not been resolved to my dissatisfaction yet. And just the idea of taking water, stealing water from these places that are already suffering from extreme drought and and climate disruption is is absolutely ridiculous, in my opinion. Well, the, uh, you know, like the rooftop solar panels, what we do first is conserve all the water yes. that we can. And we're not doing that, even coming close yet. Yes. So we're, we're wasting a lot of water. And until we actually can say that we are doing everything we can to conserve the water from the sources we get now, we shouldn't be going to some place hundreds of miles away and exploiting that because we refuse to make the sacrifices we need to to preserve our water supply. Or building developments where there are no uh, real resources in order to support the uh, vitality of that development. But that's that's a totally another conversation that we can have and we have had on this show. Yeah, you, I mean, you've touched upon uh, the most difficult question to answer because we now have a situation where we all would agree that we have a large population of people that don't have their own home. And yet we don't really have the resources, particularly water, to properly service all those homes, particularly the new ones. And then we get into the issue of how many people can planet Earth support. And we haven't even touched that issue yet. No, no. So do you feel that we have the ability to turn the corner on some of the issues that we've brought up today? Can we as individuals do personal things? Can, Can we go beyond just placing the Joshua tree on the endangered species list? Here's the problem as I see it on on almost all these environmental issues today that we're facing. We're asking people to make sacrifices today for generate that will benefit generations that they will never know. They're making sacrifices themselves and their children and maybe their grandchildren, but the benefits accrue to several generations down the line. And so we have to ask our question, do we think we're capable of doing that? And we can go back in history and look to see uh, from a historical perspective if that's ever happened in the past, because it might tell us uh, what we can do. Remember, when we saved the ozone layer, we were able to see the benefits of that in 10 years. So within each person's lifetime, certainly their children's lifetime and their grandchildren's, 
But dealing with uh, global warming, climate change, and so many of these issues is going to come down to the sacrifices our generation is willing to make for generations we will never know. Thank you for that. We have a couple minutes left here. You've written a remarkable number of books on the desert ecosystem, native plant use, wildflowers, volcanoes. How many books have you written? And and can you just tell our listeners, like, how do they find you? How do they get these books? And, you know, what else are you talking about? Well, I've written a a lot of books, that's true, which tells you that I must be older now. (laughs) I've been around a long time. I just, I love to share my love of the desert with others. And I do that through writing. And so I I like to make, I I write books that I wish would have been available when I was in my teens and 20s. And I continue to do that. I try to answer questions that people haven't answered before. I try to direct them at the lay public. And almost everything I've written is available on Amazon.com. So, so everyone go to Amazon.com and they look for? Uh, just type in James W. Cornett on your address line of your computer and it will automatically come up to Amazon. They will. I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to tell everybody, if you're, if you're listening, um, as always, go to Ecojustice Radio. We're going to continue this conversation. We have a couple more questions for you, Jim and So I just tell everyone that's listening, if you're enjoying the show, please definitely go to Ecojustice Radio, subscribe to the podcast at ecojusticeradio.org. And we're going to continue this conversation on the longer podcast. But thank you, everyone. And thank you, Jim, for joining us. Okay. Pleasure's been mine. Thank you to our guest, James Cornett of JWC Ecological Consultants. And thank you to our listeners for joining us today. This has been No More Joshua Trees climate change in the desert. Please connect with us on social media at Ego Justice Radio, SoCal 350, and Adventures in Waste. And if you like what you heard and you want others to be informed, you know what to do. Subscribe to that podcast, share the episodes, and get that information out there. You have been listening to Eco Justice Radio on KPFK Los Angeles and KPFT Houston, a project of SoCal 350. The show can be found on kpfk.org, kpft.org, all major podcast apps, and at ecojusticeradio.org. Created by Mark and J.P. Morse, executive producer Jack Ipe, producer and co-host Jessica Aldridge, co-host Carrie Kim, engineer Blake Lampkin, and original music by Javier Cadre. And until next time, remember, the power is yours.